Thank you. It's with great honour and privilege that I get to stand here as the Australian Government's Innovation Champion in Vietnam on a stage and with an audience which is crowded with inspirational and aspirational women. I'm a champion of innovation and a champion of women. But before we talk about my role as an advocate, I'd like to start by telling you about a phenomenon known in anthropology as the cargo cult. I realise this is a little bit out of the box as this is ultimately a business forum, but I'll let you in on a little secret. I am not a businesswoman, I am not an entrepreneur either. So the fact that I'm standing here in front of you today demonstrates that drawing from a diversity of backgrounds matters in more ways than one. When missionaries first arrived in the Pacific Islands, they would go out onto their newly developed airstrips with their paddles in hand and safely land the cargo planes. What was noticed was that after the cargo was unloaded and the planes left, the islanders would come out onto the airstrips with sticks and make the same motions because they believed that it was the hand gestures or the rituals that were making that precious cargo arrive. And I use this example a lot when I talk about innovation and when I talk about entrepreneurship, because we can talk about strengthening innovation, backing entrepreneurs, and supporting women to succeed. But going through the motions is not enough. We need to take clear actions. The Australian government has a clearly defined strategy, a gender and equality strategy that has three priorities. Enhancing women's voices in decision-making and leadership, promoting women's economic empowerment and ending violence against women and girls. But we do not think that by just writing this, it will happen. We heard a lot yesterday about the tools that are available to entrepreneurs. As government, we have excellent organisations like the Mekong Business Initiative and through the Investing in Women Initiative that are the ones who actually deliver on this strategy and they are delivering beyond our expectations. Excuse me. We want to provide women the tools to succeed, but we also want to teach them to go out onto the airfield and guide in that plane. We want to teach them how, beyond that, to navigate the sky for themselves, to buy their own fleet of aircraft and decide where to go to next. As a champion, my role is to advocate for the future we wish to see by seeking new opportunities and new tools that will make this a reality. But we can provide all the tools in the world, but unless you go and pick them up and use them, then our efforts are wasted. So another part of my job is to show role models. Role models that exemplify this success and exemplify people who have actually used these tools so that you can be inspired by them and inspired by others. When I was asked what I should speak about at this forum, I was told to talk about my own journey that has brought me to this stage. So here we go. When I was young, I wanted to be a marine scientist. I was inspired by amazing communicators like David Attenborough, amazing minds like Carl Sagan, and people with amazing principles like environmentalist David Suzuki. And herein lies the problem. They were all men. So as a teenage girl, I changed my path and I chose language and art and beauty over science and mathematics. When I became a scuba instructor at almost 30, I realised what a mistake I had made and decided to go to university and study marine science. I was told I was too old and that my science and maths were not strong enough to enter. So I went to vocational training instead. I took bridging courses in chemistry, and when my friends watched Hollywood blockbusters, I borrowed DVDs on algebra. I graduated from one of Australia's best universities with a degree in advanced science, went on to do my honours, and completed a PhD in marine geochemistry in 2014. Because I'm a diver, I was asked to join scientific expeditions off the coast of California and the warm waters of the Caribbean. Because I am a scientist, I have sailed to the Antarctic and danced with penguins. And because of my enthusiasm for the world around me, I have researched, written, and starred in my own documentary series for the Discovery Channel. I left science and media behind to join government because I believe wholeheartedly in evidence-based decision-making and that diversity of background, 
of experience and of voice is essential in every single boardroom and every single government meeting. When I first started thinking about these opening remarks, I had a list of incredibly accomplished women that I wanted to talk to you about. But it's not the accomplishments that mattered most. The people who have supported me and dragged me, sometimes kicking and screaming towards the toolbox that has eventually equipped me to be standing here today, are the people that I think about. I'm still so inspired by the success around me, but there is a, another woman who now inspires me too. And that's the woman that stares back at me, bleary-eyed in the mirror, every single morning. It's not my CV that counts. It's not the way that I look at counts. What you don't see standing up here with me is my fear, my anxiety, my self-doubt that have accompanied me on my own journey. But when every single door closed in front of me, I went round the back of the house to find a different door. And if that one wasn't opened, I went through the window. So in closing, learn about the tools that are in front of you. Take every opportunity that comes your way because you never know what that door is going to open. Be inspired by the incredible women that will talk to you this morning, but most of all, be inspired by the woman staring back at you in the mirror every single morning, because you are all iron butterflies and much stronger than you think. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So my name is Jenny, and uh, I'm from Finland, and I'm 30 years old now. And I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship um, and uh, also why I'm currently running Women in Tech and um, you know, what it actually is doing. Um, so first things first, could, uh, who is an entrepreneur at the very moment? Could you raise hands? Okay. And who is looking at becoming an entrepreneur? Okay. Okay. Great. So basically, um, the topic today I want to talk about is basically entrepreneurship 3.0 and why diversity is a new black in tech. And, you know, this is, uh, to start, I have to go back and kind of um, wrap it up by, you know, talking a little bit about what I've actually done and why I'm talking about these things. So basically, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur, first of all. I never had an idea of becoming an entrepreneur when I went to school. Um, and uh, so basically, I'm a very, um, from mid-class family, um, my mom is a biologist, my father is a teacher. And uh, so I went to a business school because I don't know why, I guess, because like, it's just, you know, was many options available. And um, so after that, I decided that I wanted to go to Hong Kong to study. And then I, I went and finished my studies in Hong Kong. And I felt that uh, I wanted to, um, you know, stay there. So I applied for a job and I got a uh, job in um, working for a Chinese Hong Kong investor. And uh, I started my career during the financial crisis, uh, 2008. And so I happened to be in that company for a couple of months uh, whilst the, the big crisis, you know, um, boom, you know, just boomed at us. And then um, what happened next was my boss called me and said, like, look, uh, I see an opportunity here. So what I want you to do now uh, is that I want to go to different, you to go to different, you know, factories as my kind of like spokesperson. And we're looking at investing and diversifying the business. And I was 20 years old. Uh, absolutely insane. Um, I had no experience whatsoever. I wasn't ready. Um, so um, basically, my, my daily job was that I, I went to um, you know different board meetings, you know having meetings with uh, uh, usually guys that were around you know my father's age, and I tried to kind of like you know learn what what the hell is going on, and uh, asking you know questions for my boss and reporting back, and then you know it was just uh, amazing experience. And then I stayed in that company for about five years, becoming the head of Europe eventually, and then from that on out, uh, that was my first kind of reality of what, you know, um, startup and what, like, investing also is. And then, um, and that, from there, in 2012, I started my first business. And so, again, going back to my family story, we didn't have, I didn't have any reference point what, you know, actually entrepreneurship is. Uh, my uncles told me that I'm absolutely nuts, you know, I should not do that. Um, so, but I did it anyway, and then uh, that led me into um, a path that I'm here since. So, basically... Um, I, for the first year, it was really, really tough. I lost all my savings. And then uh, from there on out, it was, it was really close to uh, closing when I actually got my first big client uh, due to, you know, references. And then actually it was just a few months when I, you know, before I started, you know, hired my first employee. And so from that IT outsourcing that I did, I moved on to startups. 
and uh, then uh, you know running an e-commerce company um, and getting uh, about uh, you know funding for it to to expand in uh, in Europe in different countries. And then uh, from there, I moved to uh, Singapore about two years back, and uh, I joined a, um, a female business angel network to to run it and basically to get more women to invest in technology businesses. Um, and this is why I am now doing what I'm doing. So hear me out. Hold on. Okay. Um, so basically, a few things about entrepreneurship and especially, you know, uh, whoever is going in it. So I want to talk about two things which I don't think we talk uh, enough about, which is failure. And so everybody basically talks about, you know, um, like the successes and like whoever got, you know, how many millions of funding. And I think that, you know, we're not really talking enough about um, what it is when you are going to work or you're going to clients and you're really like, you know, bootstrapping things and like you hear no every single week, every single day, how do you persevere? And so I think that this is something that um, I, I felt that, you know, especially once I, I found a mentor for myself, so I've been mentored by uh, fellow entrepreneurs and who are more and more successful than I am, uh, and including, for example, like my first mentor was in my first uh, company, in the Chinese investment company, uh, our, my boss and the founder of the company who kind of, um, you know, took me in and like gave me advice on what, what, you know, business actually is and what about, you know, building business actually is. So, and that kind of goes to my second point, which is why I'm doing Women in Tech, why I founded it, why I'm doing it in the first place. So, basically, um, what I found um, when I went to this um, business angel syndicate um, and uh, getting more women to invest in tech, so what I found was uh, an Im immense amount of mentorship and camaraderie. And that was something that opened my eyes as to, so I was able to meet and talk to people, especially women in very, very high positions that I would have not otherwise had access to. So I kind of realized like all this, um, the value of these networks, the women networks that are currently being created globally as well as here in Asia in a, in a country basis. So my first advice would be, especially for a female founder is that Obviously, you should not only, you know, be, uh, you know, surrounding yourself with, uh, with other female founders or female investors, but this is something that I would highly recommend as for any, anyone to go into these networks because what you find is just amazing access to resources and networks for an entrepreneur that are going to be very, very useful to you. And so, uh, basically, so we were talking about... Um, in, in that, this is just uh, to show you like why why we were talking about. So we, we talked about a lot about like why investing in women like businesses companies pays off, but um, this is something that you know we discussed a lot, and I'm kind of like um, using this as a answering question why also these kind of networks are now you know boosting and booming around everywhere globally as well as here in Asia. Um, you know all kinds of uh, women focused networks from coding to investing to C level leadership. Um, so basically, it's a business case more than it's, a, it's about equal opportunity. So, um, you know, this is um, one of the uh, rarest research that I've seen in terms of like VCs, um, you know, and, um, you know, female investment. So basically, um, VCs with female partners invest in female founders uh, in more elevated levels. Uh, and so that's why one of, this is one of our theses why we wanted to get also more women to invest in tech. So that, you know, also female founders would, you know, um, get an access to... Um, uh, more, more funding. Um, but this is now what I'm doing actually, so since then. And so last year what happened was that um, I was asked to do an event uh, in a corporation with the Singapore Technology Innovation Week uh, and together with Slash Singapore, uh, it's a conference uh, about women. And uh, kind of answering to this global phenomenon of you know, uh, huge kind of like this mushrooming, um, you know, interest in uh, in, um, in different female groups and, and organizations um, around diversity. So then we did that, and it became hu hugely popular. So now this year we're doing an actual conference, uh, 20th of September in Singapore, and we're actually going we're actually going big. So this is um, we have exhibitions, we have workshops, we have you know, a whole shebang. It's like one one day event. And one of the reasons why we're doing it is because to answer one question, whereas 
Now, there's, as everybody knows, there's so many of these groups now that are spurring out. So basically, we see a huge and immense networking opportunity here and business opportunity to get these networks together from coding to investing to uh, leadership, bringing them all together and meeting annual, on an annual, annual basis once time, one time a year. And basically um, doing this as a taught leadership conference about diversity and technology. So we want to see more deep tech companies uh, growing out, um, you know, here in Asia, and especially founded by female female founders, and so just uh, you know, so this is again going back to why we're doing it. So if you look at data, um, if you look at data, and you're looking at um, why these groups are being um, established in the first place, there's a, there's few reasons for that. According to data, I mean, we we love data, so. Data says to us that, and the research says to us that, for example, there's currently lack of uh, female role models uh, in tech. So, like, where are the, you know, the Steve Jobs and, you know, um, uh, so and so. So, where, so basically, when young women are choosing their professions early on, so you know, it's kind of hard to see your career path if you don't see if the media, media, and uh, the, the society doesn't, you know, give you those role models. So that's one one of the reasons why we're doing uh, this conference now. Uh, and of course, the second thing is uh, mentorship. So we want to invite engineers, scientists, CTOs, uh, tech-focused uh, people to basically uh, match make them, uh, especially the young um, and uh, young emerging leaders uh, with the, the people that already achieved a lot in their careers in tech. So this is something uh, as well. And uh, looking at um, you know, entrepreneurship and top leadership, of course. And yeah, and basically, like, so um, target audience we have will, um, so they will bring together about 1,500 decision makers in STEM. So this is more or less like uh, the kind of people we had last year. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm now in uh, Vietnam as well, because so we see that we want to get more collaboration now. It's, it's no question anymore. Diversity is out there. I think it's going to be changing that tech ecosystem uh, in a global scale. So if you look at Uber, for example, what has been happening, it's actually now, the diversity policies are now translating into business cases. If you are not, um, diversity will be changing also the whole tech uh, landscape because there's going to be more and more these um, uh, diversity programs being spurred out and like we'll talk more, for example, about these funds that are now being set up for, for women and supporting female founders. Um, so basically, uh, it will change the landscape eventually, and that's a great thing because diversity. We need diversity in you know in building products and you know uh, for you know thinking about the consumer. Um, so basically, this is um, and so in Vietnam, what we're looking at doing is uh, we want to have more collaboration also between these existing uh, diversity networks. So here in Asia, so we want to actually bridge these networks and kind of. Um, um, have built more collaboration between them. So for two reasons. Again, one is that you know once you are a uh, founder, so of course you need um, you need to have your network straight. You need to have mentors. So when you actually want to go global or you want to go and expand to different countries here in Southeast Asia, so actually these networks are amazing tool for you uh, to look for mentors, to look for clients, to look for investors and basically to look for uh, other um, support groups that actually can help you grow. And so going back to this. So I think that from, from our end, what we see and why I'm doing this now after the you know, entrepreneurship uh, path and basically like you know, leaving, uh, leaving uh, tech, tech focused businesses and going into more uh, policy making, you, you would call it in uh, women in tech, um, is that we believe that you know diversity is the new black in tech, and basically uh, these um, women and or diversity focus groups are going to be enormous, enormous game changer and asset to the new emerging founders and leaders uh, here in Asia. So that's more or less the thesis we have. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really great to see that not only ladies are here in this Women uh, Entrepreneur Forum, there are men here supporting women, so I'm sure that we are not alone uh, in the ecosystem as women. 
Uh, my name is Hien. I'm the country manager of the Mekong Business Initiative, uh, supported by Australian government and the Asian Development Bank. And uh, I'm also the founder of the Women's Initiative for Startup and Entrepreneurship. Uh, in short, it's uh, WISE. And uh, um, it's my privilege to be here today to introduce WISE to the startup community in Da Nang. I'm sure that uh, most of us uh, who were here yesterday and listening to Jeff Hopman's inspiring talk about entrepreneurship. And it was really touching to me. It did bring tears to my eyes when hearing the inspiring stories about the two amazing women appear at the end picture of his presentation, one from Egypt and one from Senegal. They did start their successful startup and helping the society from nothing, but their determination, their passion, and their hard work. They were not given any tool to do their business, to realize their dreams. And this is something that, we, that has intrigued us, and this is also why, why I started uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, the reason that we launched WISE is that we, we, our mission is to create a community and building a mini ecosystem for women, where women who want to start up can be connected to information, resources, opportunities, and all the support they need to do their business right and successful. Why we started, why we have wise? Women are wise, but they do not have, they do have gender specific challenges and difficulties that men don't. Evidence has shown that women do bear a lot of challenges, such as social bias, work life balance, less access to resources, lack of support, and low participation in current programs. We've done research and we also talked to startup and female entrepreneurs. And we see that the ISC, uh, the International Finance Corporation study, have shown that women um, are likely to encounter reduced property rights, low education level, insufficient networking opportunities, and others. It is very obvious in Vietnam, as an example, that in the family, it's okay for the husband to bring the land use certificate to the bank to get a loan to do their business or investment. But it's almost impossible for women if the women are not supported by their husband. In addition, the women have a lot of expectation from their family, from the society, to pursue, to, to take care of their family roles much more than men. And therefore, they have a much more disadvantages in getting connected and devoted their time to business. Work-life balance. This picture will speak louder than words. And with wise, we do not advocate for women to give up their mother's role, their family's responsibility to pursue business wholeheartedly. What WISE will try to offer is to provide some tools and skills and support to help women to balance better work and life so they can better utilize their limited resources and time to do their business, which will benefit not just them, but also the family and the whole society. About resources. It has been evident with number and backup data that female-led startups receive much less uh, investment from VC. It can come to different reasons, but another study also showed that there has been subconscious bias against women from the VC, from the angel investors. They do tend to consider women have less potential, less strength, less resilience than men in starting up. And that's why some, this is some figure, but also some other figure also say that in a countries like even Sweden, the level of investment that a female-led startup receives just 15%, while the remaining go to men-led startup. So this, this data speaks a lot. What WISE can offer? We try to promote gender mainstreaming in current programs. We know that in Vietnam, there are a lot of programs supporting startups in general, but the proportion of women beneficiaries in those programs are still limited and nowhere compared to the men, to men. Therefore, we are trying to work with different partners to increase that proportion of female beneficiaries in the program. We also offer research and data and policy advocacy for better business environment. We're going to be working with regulators, policy makers to make sure that women can get certain support, targeted support, try to help balance out the inequality between men and women in business. We also try to work to increase access to finance and, and other work. In terms of data and diagnostic, 
we are conducting ecosystem mapping, trying to understand and help others understand about the current situation of the ecosystem, what is missing and what needs to be filled. We bringing in different international tools to do the regional benchmarking to show the gap between Vietnam and other more advanced ecosystems to see what we can learn and what can be brought to Vietnam and adopt in Vietnam to support the female uh, startup ecosystem. We also try to connect female-led startup with opportunities. Uh, for example, we are working with different partners and try to provide that information about available opportunities and resources to women who, must be, who might be busy or who might not have e enough opportunities to get access to those. In terms of training and mentoring, these are essential for a successful startup. For women with their very specific need and demand, we will design telemed trainings to support them. And if, if it's not wise to design, but we are working with partners, or at least getting other training and mentoring program with other partners, be well communicated, informed to the female startup, so they can get access to those opportunities. And we also try to aim to build a network of mentors for women startup. As you've just seen from Jenny's presentation, she said that the, uh, her, her research has shown that the female led VC tend to, in, uh, to invest much more on female led startup. So, this is the community that we want to build a community of mentors for women startup, a community of investors for women startup. And also, we're going to be running and we are running an acceleration program focusing on the two sectors tourism and agriculture. Why those two sectors as the start? Because these are the two sectors that by natural, by naturally Vietnam have uh, advantages in, in developing and growing. And also the second important point is that these are the two sectors that women have a lot of advantages and are very intensive in the two sectors. But you know, through the occasion like this forum, we've met with other partners like Women in Tech in Singapore, and we're going to be thinking of connecting them with our program so that we can also be supporting Women in Tech in Vietnam as a start. The two program uh, tourism, likewise, at MIST, we're going to be connected with the Mekong uh, Innovation Startup program that uh, we have introduced yesterday. This is a tourism acceleration program that the Mekong Business Initiative will be conducting annually. And also uh, upcoming is the program Mekong Agriculture Technology Challenge, another acceleration program on agriculture. So we're going to be running together with this program and trying to top up support to female, female startups who are the participants of these two programs. To build a community, we will be organizing monthly events to raise awareness about the available support to women, to raise awareness of support to women, and also try to build the community, both the female startup and those who want to support female startup. Our website is coming in September. That will hopefully be a platform for information that the female startup and also all those who want to support them can find information they need through that. And uh, in the, uh, couple, uh, the next couple of two weeks, we're going to have two, uh, two events that if you are interested, you know, we're going to be very much welcome you to join. The first one is When Women Start Up uh, next Friday, and the, uh, afterwards is the Work-Life Balance Workshop in Ho Chi Minh City. So this is the first event. Uh, we're going to try to inspire, inspire women. We try to help them to overcome the fear the anxiety, also the, 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 um, all the hesitant if they, they still have. Or even if they fail for the first startup, they will have the motivation to start over again. We will be sharing inspiring examples for that. Uh, we have signed uh, agreement uh, for, and partnership with different partners. So this is not the full list of the partners because the list of partners are expanding every day. And we, know, we hope that you know, as a mini ecosystem, we need to come connect with everyone everyone who are interested in supporting women, and everyone who are women and want to start up. So come to work with us. You know, if you are a female startup, join our community to get the support. If you are the supporter, the ecosystem builders, the partners, come to us, because through us, you will be connected to the relevant female startup. We all believe that when women succeed, all win win. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. 
My name is Jessica Hilston and I am the founder of Women of Vietnam. Today I'd like to share with you my journey of how I got started and I'd like to share some stories of the women I've met along the way. So originally I'm from Australia and I'm Australian Vietnamese but I moved to Australia, sorry I was Australian Vietnamese and I moved to Vietnam in 2014. I used to have a corporate job and I always dreamt of starting my own business but in Perth, most people are traditional, they have real jobs and becoming an entrepreneur is very foreign for us. Um, I moved to Vietnam in 2014 and the first nine months was challenging because I didn't have a job here, I didn't know anybody here. I joined a lot of the communities but I didn't fit in. Nine months later I decided to create a community for women of Vietnam. I wanted to share with them my experiences, um, my story, how I used to look, work in business development, in aviation, and how you can become an entrepreneur. So our community is Women of Vietnam. We're a local community across Saigon, Da Nang, and Hanoi. We're a network for women to empower women. So we are 80% locals and 20% expats. We don't just focus on entrepreneurship, but we do personal development, So the idea of Women of Vietnam is to create an environment for women to support other women. Where uh, we offer monthly networking events and personal and professional development workshops. In the first year we grew, we went from zero to 4,000 members. And on average we have 65 attendees. Um, a lot of the women in our community are professionals who want to transition to become an entrepreneur. They are mompreneurs or they're also expats. Um, so why is Vietnam exciting? In most countries, it's the husband that is the breadwinner. But in Vietnam, a lot of the women, 60% of them are the total workforce are presented in all fields of women. And women in Vietnam, they make the same rate as income as the husbands. Um, the traditional norms for women in Vietnam are changing. More of them want to become independent and self-sufficient and they are not just relying on their husbands but they also want to become something for themselves. So women, business and Vietnam. <coughs> Vietnam is ranked the top 10 countries uh, in the world for women-owned businesses. Nearly a third of businesses are women owned and most of the women here, they start businesses not out of opportunity but because it's necessity. It's they have to, it's like survival. A lot of them before didn't have an opportunity to go to university so it's how do we make an income to support our families. Now those skills and those traits develop into entrepreneurship. Um, what I noticed is a lot of the women, even though they have the skill sets of being an entrepreneur, they're still lacking some of the professional and soft skills to help them take them to the next level. So, um, our community wants to connect the women, whether they are professionals or they want to transition, or they, they have a business and they want to share their ideas. Um, I was asked to share some advice to the next generation of women and so instead of sharing my own advice, I asked the women within our community to share their advice. And so for me, it's like when we first started, I didn't know where to start. So I had the idea of my worst case scenario. So for me, it, my worst case scenario of starting a business was if I fail, I can always go back to getting a real job. I can just go back to my office job in Australia. But the best case scenario is that it would become something. So what we, the next, another founder also advises is that try as many things as you can when you're younger. Test as many things, try, because the more that you test, you don't really know what you're good at and what opportunities will come out of it. Um, when you're starting out, finding a mentor is really, really important. So if you want to become the best entrepreneur, 
instead of reinventing the wheel, why not find somebody who had already experienced that journey? So find yourself a mentor, learn from the very best so that you can not avoid this, the failures, but you can learn from them and improve on other people's failures. Um, so a mentor is someone you could look up to, to seek advice for anything that you need, um, absorb that knowledge and then learn from them. But also, 99% of the time when you look back on the things that, the small things that you worry about, like if I start a startup, if I'm going to fail, sometimes the fear of failure is the, sometimes the fear of failure is a fear of holding back. But once you take that leap, the possibilities of the unknown is there. So, the founder from Saigon Cider shared with us that 99% of the time you look back over things that bothered you. Uh, and why would you care so much? It's, it, it clogs up your headspace, you know? Um, and a lot of the times that you worry about in five years from now, you're not going to worry about them so much anymore. Um, 